I have a couple of quick announcements before we begin today's talk. Uh, we're committed to making these discussions um, as accessible as possible. And so if you have any trouble with the captions on Zoom, please send us a chat. We will uh, work with you and help uh, resolve those as best we can. Um, for today, first we'll hear from Shannon and then Matthew, and then we'll open up for questions. Um, if, uh, as the artists are speaking, or now, if you have any questions and you'd like to pop those into the chat, uh, please do so. We'll get to them after. Uh, if you're on Facebook, please do the same. Messages and Mediums runs through November 13th at ROCO. Um, we're open to the public Wednesday through Saturday, 12 to 5, and Fridays, 12 to 9 p.m. Uh, all of our exhibitions at ROCO, including Messages and Mediums, uh, are supported by the New York State Council on the Arts, Farish Foundation, Monroe County, Rochester Area Community Foundation, and about a thousand other members like you. If you're not yet a member of ROCO, please consider joining and supporting all that we do here at ROCO. Lastly, our next exhibition is our annual members exhibition. It's a terrific tradition here at ROCO. It's a holiday season tradition um, that constitutes a, a really wonderful an eclectic cross-section of the visual art community in our region, and anyone can participate, and entries are due November 5th through 7th. Messages and Mediums uh, brings together two artists who explore the intersection of spiritualism and technology through their artwork. Shannon Taggart has been working with uh, and photographing spiritualist mediums since 2001. Her new series of images taken over Skype and Zoom and FaceTime during the pandemic builds upon the long history of spirit photography and spiritualism's embrace of new technology. Um, mediums believe that spirit communication cannot be bound by time and space, and the work in this exhibition advances that concept using computer screen and camera to memorialize these recent digital seances. Matthew Ostrowski's installation, Summerland, mines the history of communication, mixing 19th century hardware and 20th century software to initiate a conversation between medium Kate Fox, the youngest of the famous Fox sisters, and inventor of the telegraph, Samuel Morse. Uh, I call it a sculptural seance. Um, and by channeling the voices of these two contemporaries through long extinct media, Matthew evokes the magic lurking in our technologies, the ghost in the machine, if you will. One of the cool aspects of this exhibition for me um, that particularly excites me is the way these two artists connect the history of the region, the history of technology, and ground both of them right here in our city um, in some cases, only blocks away from our main gallery here on East Avenue in Rochester, New York. The project addresses big, timeless ideas of human invention and progress, death and the afterlife, but it ties them to historical events and physical places right here in our uh, community. Today, our lives seem to be full of complexity and fear and misinformation. Um, perhaps uh, like in the mid 1800s, uh, today's debates aren't only framed as fact versus fiction, um, especially when, as we saw a few years ago, facts can be discounted and or reconsidered as alternative facts. And I would add that algorithms determine uh, what we learn through our news feeds. Um, Faith may perhaps be even more important now than ever in deciding which new ideas we embrace, which ones we are afraid of. Um, for me, the questions are, could the challenges of our current time lead us uh, to turn toward the spiritual for answers, more of us to turn toward the spiritual? When we look back at this moment, how will we consider the role technology has played in shaping the way we think about the unknown and um, in our own local history 
And in the work of these two artists joining us today, I think some insights may be found. Um, I wanna thank both artists for trusting us uh, to present their work and sharing their work with the Rochester community and for asking us to pause and wonder at the long lasting power of belief and the far reaching effects of human ingenuity. Shannon, welcome. Thank you for sharing your work with us. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Everything, you can hear me well? Okay, great. Yes. Great. I just want to say thank you to Blue and Alyssa and everybody at ROCO for putting this together. And also thank you for pairing me with Matthew because I, I really love his work. And I think the show is a really exciting, um, you know, a double show. So thank you. Um, so the work in my, in this exhibition, um, builds off of work that I did in a book called Seance. And so I just wanna quickly frame my work in that context. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so in 2001, I started a photography project on spiritualism and spiritualism is the religion that is based on the belief that we can communicate with spirits of the dead. And I started working at Lilydale, uh, the town in upstate New York that is home to the world's largest spiritualist community. And when I began, I was working as a photojournalist and I thought I'd spend one summer making a very straightforward documentary about this quirky little town. Um, but to my surprise, what I found in Lilydale um, was really shocking to me. I learned that spiritualism was once hugely influential in our culture and that it was a hugely popular movement that influenced science, technology, art, and politics. And despite growing up in Buffalo and living in Rochester for many years, I had no idea how important that history was to this area of upstate New York. And all of these facts were missing from all of the textbooks I had studied from, even my texts on photography. Uh, next slide, please. So my monograph Seance was published in 2019 and the book was like a culmination of 18 years of this body of work. And the reason it took so long to produce is because I became heavily influenced by the history and the aesthetics of spiritualism, uh, but this material was obscure. I had difficulty showing the work because people didn't get where I was coming from with it. Uh, I was working in a context that people were totally unfamiliar with. Next slide, please. Um, I was surprised to learn about spiritualism, spiritualism's cultural importance and things like how the Lincolns held seances at the White House. Uh, but what was even more mind blowing for me was discovering that spiritualism and photography had been deeply connected uh, since their early days and learning about this uh, this whole thing called spirit photography. I had, no, I had no idea that that was even a thing until I began uh, photographing spiritualists. Next slide, please. I became fascinated by spirit photography and I was particularly blown away by the concept of ectoplasm and pictures of ectoplasm. This is a ectoplasmic picture here. Uh, so ectoplasm is this um, substance that uh, is believed to unite life with death. And you see it a lot in a lot of the shocking pictures of spiritualism. And I realized spiritualism was the first religion to create an iconography using the medium of photography. You could say spiritualism is to photography as painting is to Catholicism. And I became inspired by spiritualism's photographic past, uh, which in my opinion is one of the most bizarre chapters within the history of photography. Next slide, please. And so my work evolved and it, be, it, it ended up becoming an attempt to build onto this strange historical record, these strange uh, images that were created uh, throughout the history of spiritualism. Uh, next slide, please. So photographing spiritualism posed an immediate challenge. I was confronted with the question, how do you photograph the invisible? Next slide, please. And I began having happy accidents with my camera, uh, which I've spoken about extensively elsewhere and I discuss in my book. Uh, I started playing with photographic anomaly. Next slide. 
And I became very interested in working with mediums who combined art and technology with their medium with their mediumship, with their, with their practice of uh, spirit communication. Next slide, please. And my own photographic experiments inspired by these concepts make up a large portion of my book. Um, and this is one of the, uh, I, uh, an example, I, was, I started using some color infrared in, in some of the work that I did. Uh, next slide, please. So spiritualists have a long tradition of experimenting with media, technology, and automatic art. And this history has always been an inspiration. Uh, but uh, during the pandemic, uh, it became, again, like a newfound inspiration to me. I wanted to continue photographing mediums despite being restricted by travel and interacting with people in person. Um, but photography requires presence. And um, I, I was like, how do I photograph during the pandemic when I can't be present with people? Uh, so, you know, th thinking about this idea about communication not being bound by time or space and uh, the spiritualist uh, experimentation, I started to try to meet up with mediums on Skype and Zoom. Um, and that's it. And I had that idea, you know, based on like the, this inspiration to play with technology. Um, next slide, please. So the medium in the previous picture is shown again here in one of my experiments. Uh, this is a, an experiment with um, astral travel. Or, um, she's trying to step into her etheric body. So she's on Skype on my screen and I'm photographing the screen. Next slide, please. And Kim was one of the first mediums I worked with and we didn't begin on Skype and none of this really began on Skype. It actually began as like a photography experiment where the medium would be in, in their space um, and I would be in my own space. And with Kim, what we did is we both photographed vapor at the same time. That was like the early, how we started early on. And this is one of my photographs. I did a vapor while Kim was also, she was, in meditation, and then she did some photographs with vapor too. Uh, next slide, please. So for Kim, um, the evidential aspect was really important. So what we did is she would take my photographs and kind of make notes of what she saw. And in this picture, she, she said that she saw one of her spirit guides very clearly. And then on the right here, there's that's another comparison of like a picture she did at the same time that I was photographing and she put them together and saw a correspondence. So um, spiritualist art is always twofold. It's, it's always art that needs to act as evidence. Spiritualists are always looking as if, a, as if all of their actions are scientific method. They're always looking for evidence. And so even though it's art, it's primary um, purpose would be evidential. So once Kim decided that she thought we were corresponding it well enough, she agreed to go further with the experiments. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we committed to monthly sittings um, at, for one year. And by the end of our, our experiment, things got very complex. We were doing, um, Kim with Kim on tra in trance and I was photographing and then we both photographed steam. She would photograph it in person and I would photograph it via the screen. We had mediums who are sitting at the same time in other spaces, but not on camera sending us energy. We were doing two different um, audio recordings of ghost boxes, which they're um, a piece of technology that's kind of like a Ouija board um, that for radio waves and and um, we were also using an app that spit out words and then that was transcribed and then it would all be compared by Kim and, and myself and we would make reports and share the information so it got like uh, we ended up with a mind-boggling amount of material and it ended up being like really overwhelming analyzing it all but we did um, find a lot of correspondence. Um, like, for example, I think my slides are, uh, uh, well, um, can I see uh, the next slide? Um, okay, so for example, in this slide, K 
Kim thought she saw Dame Vera Lynn, who's a singer songwriter in England. And I don't remember exactly the connection, um, but Kim thought she saw Vera in this picture. So we used pictures of Vera Lynn then to um, kind of compare and, and show uh, what she was seeing. So that's Kim. And this is just my picture of long exposure of the screen. Um, next slide. Okay, so, um, and this is uh, another one we did of when Kim was in trance and I, I kind of refer to this picture as volcano synchronicity. Because what, what, what happened was, is I took this picture and it, to me, it reminded me of a volcano it was very uh, volcanic. And Kim, when she gave her report of the seance, she had said when she stepped in, uh, when she went into her trance state and stepped into the power, she said she saw um, energy that looked like a volcano to her. So we had that, that um, synchronicity when we were doing the photographs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a, so then, so Kim I had known and worked with before, but I used this time during the pandemic to also reach out to people I had always wanted to work with, but what was not able to travel to. So this is a picture I made with the medium Isabel Duchesne, and um, she's in Belgium, and I, we, we never got to work together. I was aware of her. She's also a spirit photographer, and she does really wonderful experimental photography of her own um, in combination with her mediumship. And actually some of them were used in the Netflix series, Surviving Death, that was recently released. There's uh, some of them in there. And so I was always inspired by Isabel's own work. And so since we weren't, you know, during the pandemic, everybody was home anyway, we connected on Skype. And this is one of the first images we made with, with Isabel in trance. Next slide, please. And this is another one. And, and um, I started to get these pictures that really did not look like Isabel in some of them. And so what Isabel would do is she would look at the pictures and then she would give me feedback. It was a lot less rigorous than uh, what, I, what I did with the previous medium, Kim Moore Cullen. And so with, with this picture, um, I, I asked Isabel what she saw and she, uh, next slide, please she saw Franz Liszt, the, the composer. And in Isabel's words, she said, she's not saying this is Franz Liszt, she's saying it could be Franz Liszt. And her connection is because one of um, Isabel's spirit guides uh, is, according to Isabel, is Rosemary Brown, who was a very famous medium. And in the 70s, she would channel composers and write new music based on um, her, seance experiences with deceased composers. And she's a really fascinating figure and she was quite popular. There's a lot of media about Rosemary Brown. So uh, Isabel was thinking maybe this is a Rosemary Brown connection that we had uh, in our experiment. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorite uh, pictures I've, I've done during the whole series um, and it's, it's Isabel and it's a, I just love it because it's very cinematic to me. It almost looks like a movie poster for a movie that doesn't exist, or at least that's what I think of when I see it. Um, so during this session, uh, we took this and then I gave Isabel the picture and I thought that the, the slide, the figure that's in red in the middle, I thought was looked very masculine to me, but Isabel was, thought, no, it, um, next slide, please she thought it was Queen Astrid of Sweden. And so she made some comparison images. And so I'm showing them here. And there is actually a, there was a very famous spirit photograph made of Queen Astrid after she died, which is um, here in the slide. So Isabel says, well, it could be Queen Astrid. And I asked what her connection to Queen Astrid is. And I guess there is a statue of Queen Astrid in her building. And she also lives on um, Astrid, street in, in Belgium. So there's, she's got some geographical connections to Queen Astrid. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is an image, this is more of a, a storytelling image about what it's like to do some of these experiments. And this is with my friend, Donna Sinclair Hogan. And she's a big part of my book and she's been a huge inspiration to me. She's done, she's an EVP uh, experimenter and she's very interested in instrumental trans communication, which is a, a term that um, is used when you try to use any kind of technology to do spirit uh, communication. And so this is 
And with Donna, it's not rigorous at all. It's very playful. It's whatever happens. We'll use and misuse our, our um, equipment. And we'll have a laugh while we're doing it. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this is one I made with Donna, just um, impromptu image that um, I love. I think it looks like, to me, it looks like a light beam come on, coming out of the jar of water. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also, it, um, I started working with other people who are in my book, uh, Jack and Margaret Munton, they're um, EVP experimenters as well and very interested in technology and have been doing experiments for a long time. And so in these images that are in the show, that's more of like a domestic view, uh, very different than the trans pictures. And in this one, they have a spirit guy named um, Redfeather. And we, they do a, they use a Ouija board, which actually is unusual in spiritualism now, even though that's a spiritualist um, device, a lot of spiritualists don't use it, but Jack and Margaret do. So they'll get the, the Ouija board out and we'll, we'll actually let their Ouija board messages um, direct whatever we do. And so the Ouija board said it would, that we were gonna get a spirit photo and Jack just held up the board and I took a picture and, um, it looks to me like there is a, re a reflection of a man in that. So, um, using you know using this photographic synchronicity, using reflections um, for messages, uh, that's what we're, we're doing a lot. Next slide, please. And this is one um, where Jack will uh, use a vape and uh, throw out smoke, and then we'll photograph the smoke, just like to experimentally to see what happens. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is one of um, Margaret in trance. Now, even though they're EVP researchers, um, the, I don't know if they really call themselves mediums, but Margaret is um, developing as a medium. I don't know how she would describe it, but she, uh, I think it's, she's still in development with, with her mediumship in certain ways. And so she started to sit into trance. And so we're experimenting with some, with her doing this new uh, process for her. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, these, these are the, the last ones I'll show. This is with um, my friend and um, the medium from Lilydale, Lauren Thibodeau. And I've been working with Lauren. I've known Lauren for a really long time. And during the pandemic, we, we thought we've never done anything like this before together on, like, on screens. And we thought we'd try to. And it's really... Um, exciting doing the experiments with Lauren because it's very playful and it's not planned, it's not rigorous, but her results were just totally different than anything I expected or anything I got with other people. Um, so this is this is one, and we're using FaceTime together. So this is one of Lauren, um, she's on my iPhone. Next slide. And um, this is another one, which um, reminds me of like, uh, almost like a joker or a clown picture or like a, a mask that came over and um it looks it, it reminds me of other pictures i've taken of her in the past that have like a of like a jokester quality to them there's one in my book that um i think this kind of reminds me of next slide please and then this is one where we we really thought she looked like a fairy and i it's very interesting to me what's happening it's very playful i'm not really i'm not i'm using the automatic process as much as possible and i'm i'm shocked by my own results which is a really weird feeling and um we were both very surprised by this image um next slide do i oh yeah great and so i just want to end here by saying that the invitation to show my work at Rochester Contemporary um, was really exciting because it allowed me to tie my work to spiritualist history in a very interesting way because it's in downtown Rochester and it's actually less than a mile from where the very first uh, public seances were held by the Fox sisters. And um, it's near the anniversary of that date too, which was November 14th, 1849. And you know, here in this picture, this is a picture taken in Lilydale of Rochester and Rochester radical Susan B. Anthony is in there. Um, she, you can see her, uh, she's, on, she's on the right to the woman holding the, the, the suffragette holding the, the flag. Um, so, you know, it was, a, 
just this very exciting way to connect to Rochester and spiritualist history um, by having the show at ROCO. And um, I was really excited by this opportunity. Uh, next slide. And this is some of the install. So for those who haven't seen it in person, you can see some of the pictures. Next slide, please. That's, uh, yeah, that's another view. And next. Oh, that's me and Lauren. So you can see she looks very different than the, um, the, the pictures I took. <laughs> Next slide. And that's the wall of the Isabel Duchesne images. And that's it for me. And I thank you. Thanks for having me. And I'll, I'll give it over to Matthew. Yes, turn on my audio. <laughs> Thanks, Shannon. That was really interesting. And uh, yeah, I would also like to give a big shout out to um, Blue and Alyssa and everyone at ROCO who has made this possible. I am thrilled to be participating in this show. And also, yes, very much because it's exactly where I wanted it. You know, <laughs> it's right in the in, in sort of ground zero for a lot of these things. So um, yes, I'm very happy to have it there. Um, you know, I think Blue made a very interesting choice in sort of juxtaposing the two of us because we're coming at it from, from very, very different perspectives. Um, and just sort of, I'm, I'm going to talk some about this project, but I wanted to sort of contextualize it into my, my sort of other work um, for starters. Um, I am not primarily a visual artist. I am primarily a musician and a composer. So I'm coming to a lot of this through a background of time-based work. And also as someone who works primarily with computer music um, through the idea of the algorithm. Um, this shot here is a um, performance. I did in Prague with um, contrabassist um, George Kramoski, who I've been working with for almost 20 years. And you can see my sort of hand waving around there. Um, I actually, I use a, um, a 3D video camera for gestural control of my computer. So um, this is sort of my live performance context, um, but I just sort of wanted to put that in. So the awareness that, that I'm coming to this very much from the perspective of someone who is interested in sound and who is interested in time um, as sort of the, the sort of larger scale um, background. Um, could we do the next slide, please? Lista? Although um, I do primarily work with sound, I also do do some work with video. And I'm particularly interested both in you'll see where this is going in a minute, in <laughs> the idea of both working with pre-existing materials, which can be cultural materials or physical materials, and then applying some kind of algorithmic treatment to them in order to sort of reveal something about the sort of socio-cultural content of those materials, whatever they are. And this is a still from a video I did in 2011 or so called Scarlet. And um, this is from the film Girl with a Pearl Earring, which some of you may be familiar with, sort of 1990s costume drama. Um, starring Scarlett Johansson and Colin Firth, um, with Colin Firth as Vermeer and um, Scarlett Johansson as, as, the, as the innocent housemaid whose um, unrequited love, their unrequited love leads them to, leads Colin Firth eventually to paint Girl with a Pearl Earring. And I was interested in this movie because what it's mostly about actually is is looking at Scarlett Johansson. Um, and of course the whole movie is about watching her because Colin Firth is watching her and the character playing Vermeer's wife is watching her and what they're particularly watching. And of course what she was particularly famous for is her lips. So what I did was I took the entire movie, all 96 minutes of it and um, uh, applied a tracking algorithm to her mouth. 
So I eliminated the entire film, except for what I thought was the actual center of gravity of the movie, which was her mouth. Um, so this is this is a single image from that. But I just sort of wanted to give the idea of, all right, the, what what is actually there there's the plot there's the story there's the thing that's sort of in front of us and presented to us as the thing we're supposed to be interested in but what we're really interested in is this sort of weird inaccessible eroticism of of the sort of hollywood star um and so this is one sort of example of the idea of trying to apply an algorithmic set of things to a sort of cultural object. And I've got another one coming up, if we could move on, thank you. Um, this is from a project I did a few years later called The Unraveling. And this is derived from the Alfred Hitchcock film Rope, which some of you may be familiar with. Rope is famous for having been um, done in 10 shots. So it was a, so it was a, reconstruction of it. it was originally done as a play and so the entire film is done in 10 about 10 minute or so because that was the longest it was possible technologically with 35 millimeter film at the time and um so here what i've done is i've taken the 10 shots it's actually 12 because i'm using the opening and closing credits as two of the other shots and applied a um applied an algorithm called a slit scan to the um to the to each of the shots and what we're actually seeing here is each one of these images is i'm not going to get into details but it's actually covering it's not one frame of film it's covering about 60 frames of film so what you're seeing is the time structure of the movie sort of smeared out so you're actually seeing a fairly large chunk of the movie all at once as you're seeing this and I thought this particular, I don't know how familiar people are with the plot. It's based on the Leopold and Loeb murders. Um, and what th the whole story of this is about a deception. And it's about the sort of surface of these, these nice rich people who are actually having a dinner party while the, the corpse of the person that the two main characters you would see in the top left um image um have murdered and is actually in a box in the room that is going to be the dining room table and so there's so much of this is about appearance and the sort of you know the sort of slick beautiful charming people and underlying this is this sort of weird evil and the sort of distorting effect of the um that the slit scheme treatment does, I felt was kind of an appropriate way of sort of revealing this aspect of the um, of the film. So yeah, so I'm interested in this idea of applying these things to make something sort of show up. Um, and um, I've what I became interested in about also about 10 or so years ago, was the idea of taking this idea, but instead of using culturally generated objects, which already have a, you know, a context that, that people are relatively familiar with, was doing it with physical objects. Because also primarily as a sound person, a physical object you know, has a whole set of sonic parameters that to me is interesting as a composer and sort of set, gives me a very, a, a particular set of materials I can work with purely in sound. But also I'm trying to sort of unify the visual image of the objects I'm working with, the algorithms that I'm using and the final sort of musical result. So, um, we're going to show a video of a piece I did called Negative Differential Resistance, which is eight um, computer-controlled 
Oh, right, stills are first. I forgot about that. Um, and this is using eight computer controlled fluorescent lights. And the idea I was thinking of in this is we have this idea of light as being something that is, is a good thing. It's a warm thing. It's a thing that 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 brings that brings illumination and clarity to things. And I thought, well, there's also this way in which it's it's almost an act of violence onto darkness. Um, and so this is this was kind of my idea and the idea of presenting it also as making one aware of the fact that there's sort of there's power behind this in this way that we are not necessarily familiar with so let's um roll that just so you kind of get a sense of what the piece is about So all of this is, um, I'm, I'm answering a question I'm seeing in the text, all of this is done in real time. Um, so there's actually, a, this is actually a generative algorithm. So there's, um, so that it is in fact infinitely, it doesn't repeat, it is constantly whoop, inventing itself in new ways. And I am mostly simply directly amplifying the sounds of the lamps themselves. There's occasional bits of processing, but I'm mostly, I was mostly trying to, to really hit you up with that 60 cycle. <laughs> um, and again, it's a little hard to tell in a, um, in a two minute thing, but it actually is, is structured. So there's a lot of variation where there are active periods and quiet periods and things like that. And this idea of working with multiples, we can go on to the next one, Alyssa, thanks. Um, I was thinking about, well, this idea of multiples is kind of interesting. And I was trying to think about other kinds of things to work with. And then in about, I'm gonna do this 2015, 2016, um, I developed this piece, um, which is called Western Electric. And this is for 15 dial phones, which I modified so I could computer control the clapper of the bells, basically. And the, the thing that I was thinking about in this piece is, again, I'm confronted with this object. And this object has a certain, it's got two things. It's got, a, it's, as a physical object, it has a set of sonic possibilities that I, as a composer, am sort of thinking about. And at the same time, it's a cultural object with a set of cultural references and we have this idea of what a telephone is and what it's like to talk on a telephone and what it's like to be on the other end of a telephone. And I was trying to think about how can I pick a, a sort of a system, an algorithm basically, which kind of plays with that idea in some way or another. And um, so 
what the way this piece works, and this is also again generative and non-repeating, is that the um, the telephones are actually listening to each other. Because I was thinking of the idea of a telephone is usually something that we think of as being a kind of channel between two people, and I thought, oh well, let's have the let's have the telephones rather than be, <coughs> pardon me something that goes between people be something that is having a conversation amongst themselves. So I developed a sort of, again, generative sonic universe based on the algorithms which mimic the behavior of, maybe some of you have seen these things of the, the fireflies in Virginia, they're also in Southeast Asia that all flash simultaneously. And there's a whole system by which they're actually listening to each other and they're constantly readjusting themselves to each other. So I sort of based on some of those algorithms, I got the idea of having, having a, creating a context where the telephones are actually having a conversation amongst themselves. And they're agreeing with each other and they're disagreeing with each other and they're going into synchronization and going out of synchronization. And that's the kind of idea behind again, trying to create this unity of object, culture, and algorithm. So we can, we can roll that one now. So that's kind of where this is sort of some background for um, how Summerland wound up developing. 
and I was thinking about sort of proceeding along these sort of similar lines and I was looking for something that would you know both sort of serve this interest in in multiples and this interest in a very particular kind of sound and and I sort of came across the idea of working with um with these telegraph sounders and but one of the things about a telegraph sounder is telephones I mean if we're above a certain age or if we've even if we aren't above a certain age and have seen enough old movies, we have a kind of sense of what a telephone means. But a telegraph sounder, not really. It doesn't really have any kind of, of cultural context for us. So I once I sort of hit on this idea of working with telegraph sounders, I started doing a lot of research um, into sort of what what did the telegraph mean at the time it was initially developed? Um, because again, if I want to figure out a way, thanks. If I want to figure out a way to sort of create this 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 single unit that I keep banging on about, you know, you need to know something about what it means and where it comes from, and I have to be able to share that with an audience because they aren't going to necessarily know it either. And when I was, um, you know, doing my, my research on this, I more or less, you know, stumbled across the, um, the extremely intimate relationship of telegraphy and um, spiritualism. And yeah, I was already, I was familiar with the Fox sisters and sort of knew about all the sort of religious history that was coming out of the burned over district and have always been kind of fascinated by various kinds of, um, let's say non-mainstream religious movements. And so I found in the process of my research that I could, I saw sort of two main um, sort of intellectual threads coming out of how people were relating to telegraphy in, um, in the mid 19th century. And one of them, which I sort of use Morse as, as, the, uh, as the avatar for, is this sort of uh, electrical, the idea of the electrical sublime and the idea of we are going to unify the world um, conveniently um, under under a sort of Anglo-Saxon um, economic economic and military domination um, through through this technology, which is of course very sort of macho, for lack of a better word, on one hand, um, but at the at the same time, you had the spiritualist movement sort of picking up on the idea that electricity, which was something that your average person had no experience of whatsoever prior to this time, was this invisible force that could do these incredible things. And here I am in Washington, I can communicate with New York City. Well, maybe there are places even farther away I can communicate. And there are other forms of energy that can be used to do this. And so the, the interesting thing about you know, modern spiritualism is, you know, in this period, when if you if you read the literature that's being read at the time, there is very little talk of what we would normally think of as religion, in the sense of people don't tend to talk about God very much. People don't, you know, it's not really angels and demons and spirits. It's magnetism. It's energy. It's a, it's a rhetoric that is completely technological. Um, and so, so I found it interesting that there were these sort of two strands going on that are both related to technology as, as a force that is sort of this sort of global uh, practical 
kind of thing. But there's also this other side of the same thing, which is also sort of pointed in the direction of not the material world, but the immaterial world. And it's also interesting, and Shannon kind of mentioned this in passing, is that you know, the, the one, the sort of Morse world is very um, male dominated and ultimately in a lot of ways, politically conservative. Um, Morse was also a, um, an anti-immigration fanatic, by the way, um, wrote crazy books about how the Austrians were gonna send all these Jesuits over to convert America to Catholicism. So then we would become the subjects of the Habsburgs. I mean, um, and on the other side, on the sort of spiritual telegraphy side, that was A, largely dominated by women and B, very much attached to what were the most progressive political causes of the day, women's suffrage, abolitionism, temperance. So you have these kind of two very contradictory things which are both in some way or another tying themselves into this identical technology. Um, so I thought, okay, this is, a, this is an interesting sort of cultural moment, right? And an interesting kind of juxtaposition. And so what, the, what you're actually listening to um, when you hear the piece is the voices or the words, the voices of Samuel Morse and Kate Fox. And what I've done, you can kind of see it in this picture here. Yeah, pointing to it on my computer screen is very helpful for all of you. Um, is I've taken texts from the two of them and all the sounds in the piece are derived from those texts. And what I have tried to do is derive is use again who it is and how the text is is presented is also sort of connected to this whole intellectual package I've created. So Morse's words um, are in Morse code and um, and you know Morse code is interesting because it was part of this this sort of universalist idea of this is this is going to be, this is going to be the way everyone was going to communicate and was for you know, the better part of a century, but is now it's gone. No one understands it really anymore. And so it is, it is this, it was this sort of attempt to communicate, which has now in some sense failed or become obsolete or been surpassed. And the texts from Kate Fox, um, I treat it in a very different way, which was, and this starts getting very computer geeky, so I'll, I'll keep it short, is I have attempted to use this um, array of 24 telegraph sounders, which as we will recall, are only capable of going click as a voice synthesizer. And I've applied a lot of the very sort of standard algorithmic procedures that are used to analyze and resynthesize voices to um, this technology for which it is, of course, completely unsuited. And to me, this is also this, this idea of attempting to take the words and bring them back, but again, in a way that does not quite work in a way that is, that is on some level um, uh, a kind of failure. Um, and because one of the things that I'm sort of interested in, in sort of getting at in this piece, sort of aside from these sort of particular historical things I've been talking about is, is how the entire the entire undertaking of communication is somehow problematic. And any kind of communication between any people, any two places, any two things, there's always a gap between one consciousness and another, whether the consciousness is alive or dead, present, past, in the room with you, in the not room with you. We're always kind of, there's always, you know, sort of the, the T.S. Eliotian shadow falling between those things. And so we are always in a position 
where we're always trying to put together whatever we can from the sort of scraps and bits and pieces of language and ideas that actually come across to available that are available to us. And the idea that this sort of rickety construction that is language in general is, is all we got, you know, so we have to sort of get it however we can in whatever way we can is, is also a sort of a big part of this piece. So in a way, the piece itself is a medium in both senses of the word. It is a medium in the sense that, you know, uh, any other form of communication is a medium or what we are going through right now through Zoom is a medium in that it is something that is taking messages from one end and presenting them on the other end. Um, but at the same time, it is also a medium in the spiritualist sense in that it is, it is gathering things from an unknown place which in this case is a technologically unknown place perhaps, um, but we don't know, um, and, and attempting to bring them to us in ways that may or may not um, be sort of absolutely clear. And we aren't even sure if there's someone on the other end to receive it. So, yep, sorry I wasn't fast forwarding you on that, Alyssa. Um, we could just like pop over to the movie, I guess. And then I'm just gonna say like two more things. So these are a couple of clips from the actual piece itself. So this is also kind of a, a, an interesting sort of aspect of how the, oops, see, there we go, whatever, um, of how we sort of sit in there with technology, which is, you know, we, we all see robots building cars and it's not that, and it's like, yeah, a robot can build a car or whatever. But seeing this old technology go by itself still has this kind of like uh, something, <laughs> this sort of slightly mysterious quality to it that, um, that I find really interesting. Um, I think that's about all I got to say. So um, thanks very much for listening. And um, there you go. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Shannon. Um, I would like to pose a question to each of you. I wanted to begin with Shannon and then um, anyone who is listening in um, on Zoom, um, please uh, pop a question in the chat and we'll get to those in just a moment. Um, Shannon, I wanted to um, ask you quickly, um, you know, Matthew uh, mentioned, and I think, you know, really it's one of the core concepts for this exhibition, um, exactly like how antiquated telegraphy is. And it seems just so, so old and almost so simple. Um, but, but yet, but yet a spiritualism is alive and well, um, and arguably growing. And there seems to be this increase in interest in spiritualism, um, and certainly, um, attention to the spiritual in art, more younger people, um, seem to be open to these practices. I wonder if you have anything to say about that, uh, kind of cultural, uh, shift that we may or may not be experiencing. Uh, yeah. So, um, it is an exciting time to be relooking at spiritualism, and and I would say one of the main reasons is because 
because of the era we are in and uh, people are more open to looking at contributions from women. Uh, so what's happening in art history is that it's being acknowledged that the first abstract artists were actually spiritualist mediums in trance, uh, such as Hilma of Klint and Georgiana Houghton, who both, both of the, these artists predate Kandinsky, who is said to be the father of abstract art. So all of art history is now being kind of reassessed basically through this lens of early spiritualism. So, and Hilmoff Clint had a, 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 her first uh, big, huge retrospective at the Guggenheim Museum in 2019. And it was the most widely attended exhibition in the history of the museum. It was, a totally, it was a totally incredible show. It was really, yes. really yeah. Wow. yeah. Yeah, and the catalog is the, the most highly selling catalog they've had. So people are, in coming to it and to know about it as a cultural movement through that a lot a lot of pe and so and a lot of there's a lot of interest in the art world so that's that's lucky for me that my book happened to come out right around this time and so it this exciting time to be rethinking because when i began it was really hard going there was a lot of resistance and not a lot of interest in, in this topic i found and you find that um just from from when you were growing up to now, um, there's more interest uh, from youth that you know or young younger people that you're around. Uh, I do know notice there there is an interest, but there's also um, it's kind of the the, the the younger people I see who are drawn to spiritualism are a lot of like uh, pagans, young pagans, or um, uh, there's a lot of uh, women like the the wit witch movement and the young women's uh, movement kind of coalescing or you know coming together but spiritualists uh to to many people's surprise they des describe themselves as rationalists and not um that they're they're following natural law and they have nothing to do with occult or paganism so so when you get you get you kind of get into the weeds because there is some crossover, but there's a lot of differences too. And um, spiritualism wanting to still stay this um, distinctive movement that's about progress and science. Excellent. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Um, Matthew, if I can kick one quick question to you, um, and then we'll get to any uh, questions that our audience may have. Um, you know, uh, this was really illustrated in the last little video clip we have there, but you also um, the, uh, the telephone. You, uh, I need you um, to repeat that because you, know, you, 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 I need you to repeat that because you're dropping out on me. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, you know, you've talked a fair amount about the importance of the algorithm and, and, and perhaps the dispassionate way in which an algorithm can be created and then content fed through that. Um, but yet, I think in a few instances, uh, I've noticed, and I think you mentioned it uh, with the telephones, you're really giving some of these objects a personality. And, and like you say, the, the telegraphs have uh, a certain kind of life of, of, of their own. There's really something magical and, and, and character uh, characteristic of them when they're tapping away sort of at each other across the room. I wonder if you have anything to say about the life you're breathing back into these objects. Well, I think, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, you know, I think, you know, people say the word algorithm and everyone goes like, oh, math and computers and da, 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 you know, but it's, it's, it's really, those are really just, you know, tools, I guess. And, and, you know, the, what I think of as the, as the art part and the composing part is is making those using these routines or whatever you want to call them to actually you know project some kind of feeling i mean a fugue is an algorithm too right so you know um but i think what i mean the thing that i find interesting is that this is also something we just do naturally is if we particularly if you see something exhibiting a behavior that does not normally exhibit we are then sort of inclined to project life into it. I mean, this is something that I think that I think we do just sort of naturally is is if we if we see 
if we see a behavior that you know in in say in say summerland where you get a feeling that there's things going back and forth or something you feel like oh that's a conversation and you know i find it interesting how those kinds of very simple uh it's it's bigger than a phoneme but some sort of very simple communicative moves you know can read to us as sort of um as narrative in some way or another you know and i think that the way that in like a if a you know if you think of an orchestra you know building up to a climax or something well then we see a bunch of people doing it so we understand that we we feel the drama and associate it with the music but if you do that with a bunch of objects then we it's very hard for us to not impute some kind of will to the objects and not and and therefore well then they're kind of like animals and then they're kind of conscious and then we sort of have that different that different kind of relationship to them you know yeah yeah no it's and and i think um, my experience of this work and and now that i've seen the video of the tele telephone piece several times um that really it actually grows you know once you become aware of your thinking surrounding that and what you're sort of projecting onto the objects it really increases at least that's my my experience of them um yeah, the, exactly, Jerry, the anthropomorphism. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Shannon, there's a question for you in the chat here. Can you see that? Yes, yes. So the, the question is, um, do, do I have any comments um, on the my experiments in Zoom uh, advancing the legacy of spiritualist photography and asking if I got any feedback from spiritualists adopting the experiments? Well, I guess I would say it's sort of the opposite in the sense that there are a lot of spiritualists and mediums experimenting with technology and photos, and I've been inspired by them and kind of try to incorporate into the, you know, my work and what I'm doing. Uh, Lauren, my friend who's in a lot of the pictures, she thinks it's really exciting and advancing and a new way of showing mediumship. But then some spiritualists um, resist my technique because <clears throat> I am my first and foremost an artist. So I'm, you know, I'm using long exposure. I'm playing with the technology as much as I possibly can. And I'm focusing on it being art rather than evidence. So there is some tension because for many spiritualists, the evidential part is primary, the art is secondary. So, um, it's there it 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 depends depends on the spiritualist you ask and i will say that we've had a number of people come into the gallery and their first the first question out of their mouth is yeah but how much photoshop was there or did she use photoshop or you know oh. that's the first the first thought only from a few people i will also say it's been wonderful to have a number of groups stop by who are dedicated to investigating paranormal they've spe specifically come to see the exhibition. So that's been cool. terrific. Yeah. Cool. I, I, should, I should just say quickly, nothing is, everything is in camera. So I'm just using camera. I'm not manipulating in Photoshop, but what I am doing, which is kind of a new aspect to this is I am using a digital dark room rather than a traditional dark room. And in a digital dark room, your dynamic range is opened up so much. So I can really get into the shadows and really get into the highlights and bring together that range in a way that you can't in a on film or in a dark room. So it is an expanded dynamic range for sure, but they're they're straight pictures. For, I mean, they're not they're not composites. It's it's all uh, you would see the same thing on my negative that you see in the picture, or my digital negative. Shannon, looks like one more quick question for you, um, uh, Greg Bishop here. Um, how has the academic psychic research community received your work? Hmm. Um. I, you know, I mean, I, there are some people in that community who are interested and by the way, hi, Greg, it's great that you're here. Uh, but I, it's, I guess you're meaning like the, the researchers, like the parapsychologists and such. Um, I'm not really sure. I know the SPR, which is the Society for Cyclical Research will share my talks and, and my book and they reviewed my book. So there must be some, but I haven't gotten a lot of feedback from that community. 
Gotcha. Matthew, um, what's next for you? Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm in a bit of a, I'm in a bit of a, a planning gap. I've, I've got, um, well, I'm, there are two, two things, I guess, that are kind of in the, in the early planning stages. Um, I was thinking about doing another video piece based on about a 30 second clip from, um, a Jacques Tati movie. Um, he was, um, he was famous for, he was one of the great users of Foley in movies. And um, he was, there was a great story I read about him sitting in a room, just recording, breaking wine glass after wine glass, after wine glass, after wine glass, until he just got just the right crash. And I was thinking about doing a piece based on that idea. And um, I've also been sort of slightly following down um, the road of this piece a little bit more is possibly doing some work um, derived from something that Shannon mentioned a couple of times in, in her talk, which is um, EVP, which is electronic voice phenomenon, which is people attempting to get um, spirit messages through various forms of technology. And that's another, that's another phenomenon, again, in this sort of idea of what is a successful piece of communication and what is a failed piece of communication I find pretty interesting. Hmm. And um, uh, Matthew, I have, to, I have to ask for all the arts administrators on the call and on behalf of the team here at ROCO and other places your work's been exhibited, have you considered um, how, your, how your pieces uh, play and affect the staff of the organization that's hosting your work. <laughs> well, I mean, this is always a problem when you do sound-based work, right? <laughs> is it's like everyone says, "Oh, well, you know, it's not gonna, it's gonna be fine," and then eventually it starts driving everyone crazy having to listen to it all the time. But um, yeah, you know, th th this is all risk you take on yourselves by booking me in the first place. So, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, we uh, we we love having the work here. Um, and, uh, I did underestimate the, uh, the impact on our, on our <laughs> psyche as it's, uh, as it loops and echoes throughout the space. Um, but, uh, but it's been absolutely wonderful to have your work here so far. The show has been well-received. I want to encourage, um, everyone who's listening in to, uh, come and see the exhibition, tell your friends to come and see the show. Um, it's up for, uh, another three weeks, um, and uh, uh, definitely, uh, if you cannot come to see the exhibition, please get on our website and read the terrific uh, text that uh, Jerry Szymanski wrote uh, to accompany the exhibition. Uh, uh, and uh, learn a bit more about how both of these um, movements um, interface with local history here in Rochester. It's really quite fascinating. People will be surprised to learn about some of the lesser known history um, in the mid 1800s here in Rochester. Um, Matthew, Shannon, anything you'd like to add before we sign off? Um, Thanks to you, oh, after you, Shannon. Oh, no, I just wanna say thank you. And I wanted to say to Matthew, I hope you do that work on EVP. I would love to uh, experience. All right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll keep in touch. <laughs> Thank you um, both for, for uh, uh, including your work here and, and, and trusting us with your work here at ROCO. Um, and I really want to thank our uh, small but mighty team of staff and volunteers at ROCO for making this exhibition happen. You see our exhibition supporters are listed on the screen currently. Um, thank you, everyone. Come and uh, visit us soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.